Seventh-day Adventism today claims more than nine million followers around the world. With its appealing emphasis on biblical prophecy, healthy dieting, and education, the Seventh-day Adventist movement continues to grow at a remarkable rate. Their extraordinary expansion is all the more astounding when one considers its humble and obscure beginnings. Based around the teachings and philosophies of its 19th century founder, prophetess Ellen G. White, Seventh-day Adventism exhibits tremendous influence worldwide. Now, with thousands of churches located in more than 200 different countries, the organization's income exceeds $1.3 billion annually. In addition to its churches, Seventh-day Adventist holdings include a vast number of schools, bookstores, health food stores, television studios, universities, and medical facilities, such as the world-famous Loma Linda University Medical Center in California. Many new converts are initially contacted through their well-publicized prophecy seminars. These seminars are usually advertised without the Seventh-day Adventist name attached. People are often unaware of the Adventist sponsorship. In addition, they use their highly touted five-day stop smoking classes and vegetarian cooking courses to proselytize as well. The Seventh-day Adventist also produce scores of high-quality radio and television specials each year in order to spread their message and attract new members. Although considered by many to be a mainstream Christian denomination, Seventh-day Adventism differs from evangelical Christianity in a number of pivotal theological areas. To determine the significance of these differences, one must examine the teachings of the late Seventh-day Adventist founder, Ellen G. White. Born on November 26, 1827 in Gorham, Maine, Ellen was hit in the head with a rock at the age of nine. She remained unconscious for three weeks, unable to attend school following the incident. Ellen's education ceased at the third grade level. Both her health and her emotions remained fragile as she grew older. David Snyder spent 22 years as an Adventist pastor. His discovery of a number of historical inconsistencies within Adventism led to his termination without a pension, just six months short of retirement. Her maiden name was Ellen Gould Harmon and she was raised in a devout Methodist home. Her Methodist family came under the influence of William Miller, a powerful preacher. He taught that Christ would return first in 1843 and then on October 22, 1844, supposedly the Jewish Day of Atonement for that year. However, using information from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, we find that in 1844, the Day of Atonement began after sundown, September 23rd, not October 22nd. So this crucial date in Adventism was flawed, incorrect from the very beginning. William Miller's meetings were marked by much emotionalism and a great deal of hysteria over Christ's imminent return. Ellen Harmon was a willing participant, but when Christ did not return when Miller predicted, she dissolved into tears and prayers and remained, as she said, in this hopeless condition for months. Ellen White just could not accept the fact that Christ did not return in 1843 or 1844. She could not admit her mistake. Interestingly enough, William Miller did. Instead, she claimed she had a vision from God, the first of many. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as He wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures. Rather than admit that she was an heir, Ellen Harmon claimed that God was the one who had made the mistake and had covered it up himself. Ellen's controversial vision forced the readjustment of many Adventist dates and doctrines. Even though the 1843 date had now been adjusted to 1844, it was still an heir. Nevertheless, the 1844 date became the foundation for many Central Adventist doctrines and beliefs, which continue to be held to this day. She became Ellen White upon her marriage to another former Millerite believer, James White, in 1846. Because she claimed to have the spirit of prophecy, she came to be the visible, absolute authority figure for the initially small group of Adventist believers. I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. 
They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Her writings grew to be 17 times as large as the entire Bible. Her followers were to reference these 5,000 articles, 49 books, plus 55,000 manuscript pages she claimed to write and regard them as being as inspired as a Bible through Ellen White's pen of inspiration. To this day, official publications of the church have used her writings as the last word on doctrine. In the 27 points of fundamental beliefs, they state that the Bible is a source of authority, but they also say that her writings are a continuing and authoritative source of truth. They have, however, made her more embarrassing writings unavailable, locking them securely away in the White Estate vault. Mrs. White wrote on nearly every area of Christian life, including doctrine, diet, health, recreation, and marriage. Many of her writings were done from Elmshaven, her California home. She claimed an angel stood by her bed near this chair in her bedroom. They further believe that the three angels mentioned in the Bible book of Revelation carry three unique messages, the investigative judgment, the Saturday Sabbath, and Sunday worship being the mark of the beast. Sidney Cleveland was an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister who pastored 13 churches between 1979 and 1990. While doing research for a planned book validating the divine inspiration behind Ellen G. White, Cleveland discovered so many false prophecies that he became disenchanted. Eventually, he published his findings in a book titled Whitewashed, Uncovering the Myths of Ellen G. White. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded on prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's no coincidence that the Bible contains many warnings about false prophets. The Bible test of a false prophet in Deuteronomy chapters 13 and 18 is simply whether or not the prophecy comes true. It's a matter of historical record that the following prophecies of Ellen G. White did not come true as she foretold. Then I was pointed to some who are in the great error of believing that it is their duty to go to old Jerusalem and think that they have work to do there before the Lord comes. I saw that Satan had greatly deceived some in this thing. I also saw that old Jerusalem never would be built up. The exact opposite of Ellen White's prediction has happened. Old Jerusalem has been greatly built up in the years since 1948 when Israel became a nation. She was absolutely wrong. Again, Mrs. White foretold in early writings that she would be among the living saints when Jesus returned. Soon our eyes were drawn to the east, for a small black cloud had appeared, about half as large as a man's hand, which we all knew was the sign of the Son of Man. The graves opened, and in the same moment we were changed and caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Mrs. White was not among the living saints seen in her vision. This event did not occur in her lifetime. We are still looking for the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rather than being caught up with the living saints at Jesus' return, Mrs. White died on July 16, 1915, and was buried beside her husband James. Another one of her prophecies failed. Like others of her time, Mrs. White taught the imminent end of the world to spur on her workers. In early writings in the 1850s, she urged the new converts on, telling them they only had a few months to wait. But now time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. These were not isolated prophecies, but restated over and over again. In May 1856, at a church meeting in Battle Creek, Michigan, Mrs. White boldly stated, I saw that some of those present would be food for worms, some subjects for the seven last plagues and some would be translated to heaven at the second coming of Christ without seeing death. In biblical times, she would have been stoned to death for being a false prophet. Mrs. White did not confine her prophesying to the events surrounding the coming of the Lord, but prophesied how foreign governments would act against the United States. 
In 1862, Ellen White predicted the downfall of the United States following a great war involving many nations. During the Civil War, she prophesied that England would declare war on the northern states and humble them into the dust. Said the angel, when England does declare war, all nations will have an interest of their own to serve, and there will be general war, general confusion, this nation will yet be humbled into the dust. History proves the utter error of this prophecy. England did not declare war on the northern states. Other nations did not join in. The United States of America was not humbled into the dust in defeat. Mrs. White, again, clearly to the objective mind, prophesied falsely. Mrs. White, in a vision, also claimed to have traveled complete with wings to various planets which were full of inhabitants. She reported meeting Enoch on a distant planet during one of her journeys. Other times, she saw angels using Golden Gate passes to go in and out of heaven. Some of her so-called visions reflected her own racist views. For example, she believed that certain races of people were the result of sexual relations between man and animal, which she referred to as an amalgamation. Every species of animal which God had created were preserved in the ark. The confused species, which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men. Despite the unbiblical nature of her visions, her followers continued to accept her as God's messenger and her writings as inspired as the Bible. Dale Ratzlaff was a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist who served as a pastor and Bible teacher. He was educated in their school system from first grade through seminary. His extensive and in-depth knowledge of the writings of Ellen G. White eventually led him to write two books, The Cultic Doctrine of Seventh-day Adventist and Sabbath in Crisis. The investigative judgment doctrine that Seventh-day Adventists still cling to came from a reinterpretation of William Miller's failed prophecy that Christ would come to the earth on October 22, 1844. At first, Adventists believed the door of mercy was shut on that date. Ellen G. White, with prophetic authority, supported both this date and the shut door belief. Her first vision contained a fearful judgment on Adventists who had given up the 1844 message called the Midnight Cry. She said they had fallen off the path to heaven. It was just as impossible for them to get on the path again and go to the city as all the wicked world which God had rejected. Years later, when her first vision was reprinted, even though the preface stated that no changes were made in idea or sentiment, the portion of her vision which taught the shut door to salvation was just left out. After 1851, the other shut door passages were either dropped or reinterpreted. An explanation for the 1844 disappointment had to be found. Two Millerites, Hiram Edson and Mr. Crozier, introduced a new sanctuary theology which taught that instead of Christ coming visibly to earth in 1844, he entered for the first time the most holy place in heaven. This new teaching gave them a way out of their dilemma without actually admitting their error. Ellen G. White immediately put God's endorsement on this new explanation for the date October 22, 1844. The Lord shew me in vision more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light of the cleansing of the sanctuary. All doctrines were soon adjusted to fit 1844 as the cleansing of the sanctuary and the beginning of the investigative judgment. The shut door had to be opened to allow salvation for their own children who had been born after 1844 and to evangelize others into Adventism. Salvation for everyone, even those who lived in Bible times, had to be conditional on this judgment, and so soul sleep was introduced. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation had to be reinterpreted to fit the investigative judgment. 
It was a time of turmoil and doctrinal reversal, but the investigative judgment doctrine survived with Ellen White's stamp of approval. At the time appointed for the judgment, the close of the 2300 days in 1844 began the work of investigation and blotting out of sins. All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny. The terms of this new investigative judgment doctrine, or sanctuary doctrine as it came to be known, were harsh. It taught that a recording angel now kept track of every move, even to the extent of recording wasted moments, where one might want some leisure time. Every man's work passes in review before God and is registered for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. Opposite each name in the books of heaven is entered with terrible exactness, every wrong word, every selfish act, every unfulfilled duty, and every secret sin with every artful dissembling, heaven-sent warnings or reproofs, neglected, wasted moments, unimproved opportunities, the influence exerted for good or evil, with its far-reaching results, all are chronicled by the recording angel. Truly this doctrine of investigated judgment, unique to Seventh-day Adventists, has colored every other doctrine in the movement. There has been much controversy and debate since it cannot be supported from the scriptures. In his book, Movement of Destiny, noted Adventist historian and theologian Leroy Froome states that any weakening or denial or submerging of the sanctuary truth is not only a serious but a crucial matter. Any deviation or dereliction therefrom strikes at the heart of Adventism and challenges its very integrity. This central Adventist doctrine, which states that the judgment of believers' works will determine their salvation, is blatantly unbiblical and is not taught by any legitimate Christian denomination. This doctrine teaches at some point in time between 1844 and the second coming of Christ, every believer's name will come up in judgment. At that point in time, if one has any unconfessed sins, even forgotten sins, or if one does not demonstrate perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments, especially the fourth, he will be lost. This teaching is diametrically opposed to the New Testament gospel of grace. In all man-made religions, the authority of God's scripture, an unchanging word is challenged. The Seventh-day Adventists are no exception. They have their own version of the Bible, known as the Clear Word Bible, which inserts the words and ideas of Ellen G. White directly into the biblical text. For example, in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, 300 words have been added to the Holy Scriptures. A blatant example of this type of alteration can be seen in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which in the King James Version simply reads, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. However, in the Adventist Clear Word Version, this passage has been greatly altered to read, After 2,300 prophetic days, or 2,300 years, God will step in, proclaim the truth about himself, and restore the ministry of the sanctuary in heaven to its rightful place. This is when the judgment will begin, of which the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary was a type. One can see the extent to which Seventh-day Adventists are prepared to go to support their prophetess, even to the manipulation of scripture. The Clear Word Bible, published in 1994, as an expanded paraphrase to nurture faith and growth is nothing more than added distortions to the Word of God to support Adventist theology. They have also published their study Bible with Ellen G. White quotes included as an inspired commentary. Other heretical Adventist doctrines include the teaching that Christ's atonement for sins on the cross was incomplete that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel, and that there is no hell. During the mid-1800s, within a few years of each other, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian Scientists, and Seventh-day Adventists were all presenting doctrines contrary to those held by traditional Bible believers. 
Leslie Martin was a devoted third-generation follower of Seventh-day Adventism, who believed Ellen White's writings were inspired by God. The instruction she had received in their school system, however, started to unravel when she began to study the Bible. Many of the doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists are similar. This is because they had common roots. The founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taze Russell, even co-authored a book called The Three Worlds with N. H. Barber, an early Adventist. The Jehovah's Witnesses are only one of the many split-off sects of the Adventist movement. Both Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses still cling to the heresies of soul sleep and Michael the Archangel being Jesus. Early prominent Adventists, including James White and Uriah Smith, denied the deity of Jesus Christ, as do the Jehovah's Witnesses. Both Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists have produced their own altered versions of the Bible to reflect their aberrant doctrines. Both have set false dates for the return of Jesus Christ and failed miserably to prophesy correctly. Both have covered up their errors and claimed to be the only remnant church in the world. Both have been guilty of plagiarism of earlier works without giving credit to the previous authors. In 1982, an Adventist pastor, Walter T. Ray, released this book called The White Lie. It was dedicated to all those who would rather believe a bitter truth than a sweet lie. He loved Mrs. White's writings and thought that he should read what she read. He began to see huge amounts of plagiarism in her writings. Through diligent research, it was discovered that her supposed inspiration from God had been borrowed from other authors without proper credit being given to the original sources. Her major books, including Patriarchs and Prophets, The Desire of Ages, The Spirit of Prophecy, The Great Controversy, Selected Messages, The Acts of the Apostles, Christ's Object Lessons, Councils on Stewardship, Evangelism, Fundamentals of Christian Education, Gospel Workers, Messages to Young People, The Ministry of Healing, my Life Today, Prophets and Kings, Sons and Daughters of God, Steps to Christ, Testimonies to the Church, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, and others contain plagiarized materials stolen from earlier writers. One book, Sketches from the Life of Paul, was plagiarized in its entirety by Ellen G. White. It resulted in a lawsuit, and the book was quickly taken out of print. Despite the irrefutable evidence, the Seventh-day Adventist Church chose to fight back against these charges with a book titled The White Truth. In it, their main line of defense was that since there were no copyright laws at the time, Ellen G. White hadn't actually broken the law, which of course sidestepped the issue. The book further attempted to firmly reinforce Mrs. White's standing as a divinely inspired prophetess by stating on page 61 that what we are as a church is a reflection of our faith in the divine authority, evident in the writings of Ellen G. White. Yet the Seventh-day Adventist hierarchy has been unable to respond to the challenge to prove that even 20% of her writings were original. Equally as shaky were the visions she claimed to have from God. Some of these visions turned out to be nothing more than verbal descriptions of paintings and drawings that she had seen in previously published books by other authors. Dan Snyder followed in his father's footsteps by becoming a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. His examination of Ellen G. White's teachings caused him to eventually leave Adventism and enter the Christian ministry. Researchers examining the early documents containing Ellen G. White's advice on diet and health are usually in for a rude awakening. We must concede that she was, after all, a Victorian lady with very reserved ideas on the opposite sex. Most of her health advice had to do with bringing into submission the male sexual appetites, which she considered excessive. Her advice on the subject is lengthy, but her belief was that these sexual appetites could be controlled by diet. First, she gave a list of foods to avoid. Minced pies, cakes, preserves, and highly seasoned meats with gravies create a feverish condition in the system and inflame the animal passions. Dispense with animal foods and use grains, vegetables, and fruits as articles of diet. Adherents were exhorted to sip no more the beverage of China, no more the drinks of Java. 
Our Heavenly Father sent the light of health reform to guard against the evils that result from unrestrained indulgence of appetite. Many people believe that the vegetarian lifestyle of Seventh-day Adventism is a healthy alternative, and many people are drawn to Adventism because of their health message. We were taught as Adventists that we had a special message for the world with our health message, and that our prophetess, Ellen White, was years ahead of her time. To bring under control the male sexual appetites, besides being vegetarians, it was advised by Ellen White that they not eat an evening meal at all. Women were not immune from Ellen G. White's health advice either, and she further controlled her female followers by issuing directives on their hairstyles and manner of dress. Speaking of wigs and other hair pieces, she said, The artificial hair and pads covering the base of the brain heat and excite the spinal nerves centering in the brain. In consequence, many have lost their reason and become hopelessly insane by following this deforming fashion. Yet the slaves to fashion will continue to thus dress their heads and suffer horrible disease and premature death. Once the deadly peril of wearing wigs was dealt with, Ellen G. White tried to force a hot, uncomfortable, strange style of dress on her female followers. She claimed it was designed by God and was in reality a pair of pants with a bulky long dress over them. God would now have his people adopt the reform dress, not only to distinguish them from the world as his peculiar people, but because a reform in dress is essential to physical and mental health. Faithful sisters struggled with the cumbersome dress until Ellen White quietly stopped wearing her some years later, with no explanation given. When some zealous Adventist women tried to restore the wearing of the garment, believing it was God's will, Ellen G. White rebuked them. During this period, the control of Ellen G. White over her followers continued to grow tremendously, particularly when she announced that those who were not following her dietary orders would be left behind at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Our prophetess Ellen G. White taught that we should be vegetarians, especially in consideration of the soon return of Jesus Christ. Because if we were not vegetarian when Jesus came, we would not go to be with him when he came to gather his people. Mark Martin is currently pastor of Calvary Community Church in Phoenix, Arizona. He is a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor who resigned after being forced by the Adventist authorities to choose between the teachings of Ellen G. White and the Bible. Ellen G. White stressed the keeping of the letter of the law along with many added rules to put one on the road to salvation. She had no patience with Christians who dared to say, I am saved. We are never to rest in a satisfied condition saying, I am saved. They pervert the truth. They declare that we have only to believe on Jesus Christ and that faith is all sufficient, that the righteousness of Christ is to be the sinner's credentials. This class claim that Christ came to save sinners and that he has saved them, but are they saved? No. The Adventist view of salvation is that Jesus made the down payment for our salvation at the cross. But once you've accepted his offer of salvation, you've got to keep making up the monthly installments. So not really relying upon the grace of God alone to save them, Adventists are striving to be rigidly obedient. And this makes for an inflexible, guilt-ridden, legalistic lifestyle. Despite modern Adventist attempts to soften law-keeping, Ellen White's teachings are unmistakable. No one is saved who is a transgressor of the law of God. Yet the Bible teaches that we are under a new covenant, and the old covenant is obsolete. Christ is the end of the law. The New Testament teaches that the law was given by God to be our tutor, or teacher, leading us to Christ. Listen to what Galatians 3.25 says. It says, we are no longer under a tutor. Christians are to grow in grace and keep God's commandments out of a love for Him, not under compulsion. In fact, being under the law leads to sin. 1 Corinthians 15.56 says, The strength of sin is the law. In contrast, being under grace leads to holiness. I love what Titus 2 verses 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, 
It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Salvation by grace through faith alone is the heart of the gospel. But the Adventist doctrine of the 1844 investigative judgment colors all their major doctrines. It was because of this false teaching, also known as the pre-Advent judgment, which amounts to nothing more than a judgment of works which determines salvation, that the unbiblical doctrine of soul sleep was introduced. Obviously, you couldn't have believers going to heaven when they died before their lives were supposedly judged. What if they hadn't been good enough? They'd have to leave heaven, right? So the Adventists teach that when a person dies, he or she goes into the grave, into non-existence. But this teaching flies in the face of the scriptures, which clearly state that to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5.8. And when a believer dies, he departs and is with Christ, Philippians 1.23. Another thing that people might not be aware of is that Seventh-day Adventists do not teach the biblical doctrine of hell. One of the primary distinctives of Seventh-day Adventism is the keeping of the Saturday Sabbath. To keep the seventh day is seen as a mark of true loyalty to God. The idea of the Seventh-day Sabbath was not original to Ellen White, though. It was, in fact, initiated by a Seventh-day Baptist contact and Joseph Bates, who subsequently talked James and Ellen White into the idea in 1846. Ellen obliged by conveniently having a vision and this introduced the teaching to her followers. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers. In the early years, when the Sabbath observance was kept, it always began at 6 p.m. Fridays. It was before sunset in the summer and after sunset in the winter. This went on for over nine years since the Bible says the Sabbath was to be kept from sunset to sunset, a division arose. The matter was studied and presented to the Adventist Conference in 1855. Finally, they voted to keep the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. There was still dissent, however, among Adventist followers. Mrs. White decided to have another vision to settle the matter. A delegate to the conference reported that after the conference November 20th, the vision was given establishing those undecided on the sunset time. Far from the convenient vision establishing the matter, the Adventists continued to ask questions. Why could they not believe Mrs. White's original visions concerning the 6 p.m. Sabbath? Why the change now, nine years later? Had they not been, in fact, Sabbath breakers and not Sabbath keepers for the first nine years of the practice? It required another vision by Ellen White in which she promised to question the angel and get an explanation to cause the controversy to die down. I inquired why it had been thus, that at this late date we must change the time of commencing the Sabbath. Said the angel, ye shall understand, but not yet, not yet. Mrs. White died without ever giving the promised explanation from God. However, the keeping of the Sabbath from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday came to be of prime importance in determining who would receive the seal of God and be saved and who wouldn't. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. The keeping of the true Sabbath is an evidence of loyalty. One class received the mark of the beast. The other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, received the seal of God. So, failing to keep the Sabbath resulted in one receiving the mark of the beast and losing one's eternal life. Today, the view is equally severe. On page 167 of the Adventist publication, 27 Fundamental Doctrines, it says, when this issue is clearly brought before the world, those who reject God's memorial of creatorship, the Bible Sabbath, choosing to worship and honor Sunday in the full knowledge that it is not God's appointed day of worship, will receive the mark of the beast. This mark is a mark of rebellion. 
So even today, Seventh-day Adventists have made salvation ultimately dependent on which day of the week one worships. Several New Testament scriptures clearly identify the seal of God as a work of the Holy Spirit, not the keeping of a Sabbath day. For example, Ephesians 4.30 plainly says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Mrs. White has no support at all for linking the seal of God with Sabbath keeping. Christ's followers met on the Lord's Day, Resurrection Day, for their worship and breaking of bread, not on the Jewish Sabbath. Adventists further deviate in their salvation doctrine by teaching that Satan ultimately becomes a sin bearer. They teach he bears away the sins of the world. As the priest, in removing the sins from the sanctuary, confessed them upon the head of the scapegoat, so Christ will place all these sins upon Satan, the originator and instigator of sin. How different this is from the clear message of Scripture, which says of Jesus that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. The Apostle John exclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Truly, salvation must be centered on Christ alone. Steve Cannon, Southwest Director of Personal Freedom Outreach, a highly respected cult research ministry, has examined the question of whether Seventh-day Adventism should be classified as a cult. Today, Seventh-day Adventists strive to be included as mainline evangelical Protestant Christians and therefore object very strongly to any hint that they may be teaching cultic doctrines. An Adventist pastor supplied the following five marks of a cult. You be the judge of whether or not his denomination fits his own definition of a cult. Point one, cults or false religions usually have a single powerful human leader who becomes the cult's quote, Messiah. Who can deny the total reliance of the group on the teachings of Ellen G. White? She may not be called their Messiah, but is certainly their messenger of God, revered by all. Point two, the cult leader's word, or teachings of the cult, become absolute truth, overshadowing the teachings of the Bible. No Seventh-day Adventist would dare deny that Ellen G. White's comments on a certain portion of Scripture determine the group's acceptance or rejection of historical views held on those Scriptures. Her interpretations prevail and become Adventist doctrine. Even today, her writings are considered to be of equal inspiration with Scripture. Point three, each cult uses pressure tactics to coerce members into submission. Ellen G. White knew how to pressure people into submission. First, she would claim to receive a reproof from God for the person, which she would air publicly through her testimonies. Usually, the person conformed under the pressure. I have uttered reproofs because the Lord has given me words of reproof for the church. The tactics may not be as blatant today, but believers are subject to pressure tactics today as well to conform to the group. Love, acceptance, and fellowship are very often withheld from anyone who questions the official teachings of the church. Point four, each cult denies the central truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the divine Son of God, without beginning or ending. They deny that his death has provided salvation for the entire human race. As a result, salvation is earned by adherence to the teachings of the cult, rather than accepting Christ and following him. We would point out that the group originally denied the deity of Jesus Christ. Today, they believe Jesus Christ is eternal, but they are stuck with the old doctrine that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. They need to firmly establish one doctrine and discontinue the other. However, they cannot give up this doctrine which contradicts Hebrews 1.13 without having to acknowledge that Mrs. White made a mistake. Instead, they try to accommodate both conflicting doctrines. This is an impossible situation. As to salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, Adventists have added the investigative judgment, the keeping of the Sabbath, and obedience to the Ten Commandments, and other Old Testament laws as requirements for salvation. In addition, 
They believe the world's sins have been placed upon Satan rather than Christ, and that Christians must stand before God without Christ as their mediator. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Contrast this with the plain statement from the Bible in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 concerning Jesus Christ. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Truly the salvation for the Seventh-day Adventists placing sin upon Satan is not the salvation taught in the Bible. Point five, cults often urge their converts to leave their families. At last we can find a point on which we can agree. Adventists do not urge their converts to leave their families. That means that out of the five points marking a group as a cult, four of them apply to Seventh-day Adventists. Many feel this is too cult-like for them. During the 1950s, certain well-known evangelical Christian ministries approached the Seventh-day Adventist hierarchy in an effort to find out the true nature of their doctrinal beliefs. In a gesture similar to the Mormons, the Adventist leaders desiring the approval of the Christian community at large deceptively espouse the evangelical view of salvation by grace alone. While this temporarily pacified many Christian denominations, it wreaked havoc within Seventh-day Adventism. Many followers felt betrayed and began searching the teachings of Ellen White for themselves in an effort to discover the truth. Those who did were shocked at what they found. What began for many as a quest to validate Adventism turned instead into a lurid discovery of the plagiarisms, false prophecies, and heretical teachings of Ellen G. White. I was born and raised a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist, tracing our family roots back to the Kellogg family. I was educated in the SDA elementary system, was baptized at a young age, and truly committed to what I believed was the only true church. The turning point was when um, we got invited by several different people to come to a church that had a, a pastor that was a former SDA pastor. Um, and I agreed to meet with him and didn't think he'd have anything to show me. But he did, and I realized that the Evans Church had deceived me. Don and I are both third generation Seventh day Adventists. We were educated in the Adventist high schools and colleges. Later, we were both faculty members at Pacific Union College. We were loyal Seventh day Adventists, fully believing that Ellen White was truly inspired of God and equal with the Bible. I gave myself wholeheartedly to the Adventist faith and gave every bit of my spare time to meetings and sharing my faith. I saved up lawn mowing money as a child to buy and study the books written by Ellen G. White. Nobody was more loyal than I was. I would have laid down my life for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I truly believed in the remnant church concept and Ellen G. White. Um, when I found, found out what the church actually knows about what Ellen G. has written, how she obtained her material, um, I was never presented with that in the school system. I never, never heard anything about um, all these writings that she had copied, plagiarized, and when I saw that, that just that hurt me a lot. I felt like I had been lied to. Several years ago, I knew, without a doubt, with special gratitude to Pastor Mark Martin's ministry to Adventists, that God was calling me to leave the Adventist faith and ministry. I began to see the church was inconsistent theologically and politically. When expedient, they contradicted the Bible, contradicted Ellen G. White, and contradicted their own church manual. I have never regretted my decision to leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Spiritually, it was the best thing I ever did. One month later, I received a call to pastor at an evangelical church. The last three years have been the most spiritually rewarding of my 31 years as a Christian. I am part of the family of God that truly upholds the Bible as the sole authority of both faith and practice. Jesus saves us not by our deeds. Even if they may appear to be a really good deed, we're not saved by what we do. Not by lifestyle, not by diet, but by what Jesus has done for us. The rules are there and they just keep them under bondage and I don't want to be in bondage. I want to. 
I want to have the freedom in Christ. For Don and me to have had a part in this ongoing search for salvation for ourselves and for others has been an eternal blessing. I, I really, as the surety of the gospel, I know, I know that there is, that we are uh, saved in Christ. That, that we have that confidence, and that makes a great deal. It means a great deal. I now pastor a wonderful non-denominational Christian church. It is so good to be free of the quagmire of Seventh Day Adventism and be able to rejoice in the consistent love of Jesus Christ and His unchanging Word. I'd really just advise anybody that is in the Adventist Church at this point, or I would encourage you to look at, look at what the Bible says. Put Ellen G. White aside for a little while and look at what the Bible teaches you. Talk to people that have um, come out of the church, ask them why, see if they have anything to share with you because you're not going to be able to get this information from your church. You really just have to search for it yourself. And if you, if you love the Lord, if you really do, then you really want to know the truth. The Bible says, for the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. And that's, that's how I feel now.